Welcome everyone. This is John Campbell and this is the first module of Lecture 1, Economics 1723 Capital Markets. We're going to be discussing basic concepts of finance and arbitrage in theory. So welcome everyone. The roadmap. First we'll talk about very basic concepts and then we'll move on to discuss arbitrage as a theoretical proposition. So I want to introduce to you three basic concepts of finance, arbitrage, optimality, and equilibrium. Arbitrage is a concept of eliminating risk-free pro profit opportunities. The question that we ask is what can we say about asset prices by making only one very weak assumption that there are no risk-free profit opportunities, in other words, that there's no free lunch uh, to put it in more popular terms. Optimality goes on to consider uh, an optimization problem, a decision problem of an individual investor. And we ask, for example, what is the best combination of risky financial assets given the returns they offer and the preferences that an individual has? So in order to talk about that, we're going to have to introduce uh, concepts of utility for individuals, risk aversion, and so forth. And then finally, at the third level, equilibrium asks what is the nature of asset prices and allocations when all investors have optimized and the market's clear. In other words, when investors come together and trade financial assets, uh, what does the resulting equilibrium look like? So optimality and equilibrium are the basic concepts of microeconomics, and you've probably encountered them in that context. Arbitrage uh, is more specific to finance, and so we're going to begin with that. So let's uh, set up a very simple framework that will help us organize our thoughts about assets. Uh, we're going to assume that there are two periods, call them now and the future, or we might call them today and tomorrow, but I want to be vague for the moment about the length of time between these two periods. Now, we want to capture uh, some notion of uncertainty, and we're going to do that in the simplest possible way by assuming that there's only a finite number of states that may occur in the future. We're going to call that finite number capital S. And we're going to number the states by the letter little s, which is going to run from 1 to big S. We're also going to assume that only a finite number of assets are available. And we're going to index the assets by uh, little n, which runs from 1 to capital N. So this device of states, discrete possible states that may occur in the future, is a very simple one. It's going to enable us to capture uncertainty with a minimum of mathematical apparatus. All right, so what defines an asset? Uh, assets cost money now. You have to buy them now and they're going to pay off in the future. You're going to get some payment back in the future, but that payment is random because it's going to depend on what state occurs. So assets are defined then by their payoff profiles across the possible states. So for notation, we're going to say that asset n, little n, pays off an amount x, which is indexed by the asset n and the state s in which the payoff occurs. So x little n, little s, in state s. Now, if we think across all states, uh, we have a payoff in state 1, that's xn1, a payoff in state 2, that's xn2, um, payoff in state 3, and so forth, going up to uh, state capital S. So we can uh, stack all of these payoffs across all of the S states into a row vector that looks like this. We have the payoff for the first state, the second state, and so on up to the capital S state. So this is what we mean by a payoff profile here. This vector tells you how payoffs vary across states. And then, of course, to buy the asset today, now, you have to pay some price. Let's uh, write little p subscript n for that price. All right, now, uh, we want to consider all assets together, and uh, that's going to be more notation, but we can use matrices to economize on the notation. So if we consider the n assets together, they're jointly defined by a, a matrix that has n rows and um, actually s columns. This should be n by s. 
so an n by s matrix X that looks like this. The first uh, asset is the first row, the second asset is the second row, and so on down to the nth asset is the, the bottom row, which is the nth row. And then there are s columns. The first column says what happens if state 1 occurs. The second column tells you what happens if state 2 occurs, and so on up to the final column, the right-hand column, which is the sth column, and that tells you what happens if state capital S occurs. Similarly, we can take the n assets and we can stack them into an n by 1 vector, uh, which we write little p, and so we've got the price of the first asset at the top, and then we run down until we get the price of the nth asset. Now the next point I want to make is that we can combine assets to obtain uh, new assets or portfolios. Okay, and this is a very basic uh, concept in capital markets, is the construction of a portfolio. How do we do that? Well, we can buy some number of units of, of each asset and put them together. So let's use the notation uh, W. W little n is the number of units of asset n that we buy, and we can do that for each n from 1 to capital N. Now we can stack the number of shares that we buy into another vector, little w, where the number of shares in the first asset is up here at the top, and then the number of shares in the second asset, and then so on down uh, to the nth asset. All right, what's the payoff on the portfolio? What are we going to get uh, by doing this? Well, the payoff on the portfolio can be written as w prime x. What's that? That's just the sum uh, across all the assets of the um, portfolio weights times the payoffs in the first state. All right? This is an average across assets where the weights are these unit holdings of each asset. We're taking an average across assets of the payoffs in state 1. That gives us the payoff in state 1. That's the first element of this vector and so on for the second state, third state, and so on up to the last state. We're considering state capital S. Each asset pays off XN, XNS in that state, and we weight that by the number of shares of the asset we have, which is WN, and we add up across the assets. Okay, so now we have um, a portfolio with a new payoff vector, which is constructed by averaging the old ones. And of course, the price of this portfolio is constructed the same way by averaging the prices of the uh, of of the assets using these W ends as weights. All right. So at the end of the day, we have uh, a new asset uh, or payoff profile that we've constructed uh, using the old ones. The next concept I want to tell you about is the concept of Arrow de Bruyne securities. Uh, we're going to Suppose that uh, by cleverly combining assets, we can construct a portfolio that pays $1 in one of the states and $0 in all the other states. Okay, let's suppose that, that it's state little s where we get $1 and in all the other states we get 0. This asset is called an Arrow de Bruyne security for state s. That's after a Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Bruyne, a Nobel Prize winning economist who studied general equilibrium. Uh, and what these things are are fundamental building blocks for asset pricing. Now, uh, we're going to write the price of the Arrow de Bruyne security for state S as a Q sub S. And we're going to call that the state price for state S. Intuitively, what this price tells you is how much it costs today to get paid in the future if and only if state S happens. So it's the value today of a dollar payable in state S. Now, this is a fairly abstract construct. Uh, it's a theoretical, artificial uh, construction. Uh, but these Arrow de Bruyne securities give us a lot of analytical convenience. They help us to think about uh, financial markets. Now I'm going to talk about the concept of complete markets. What does it mean to say that markets are complete? Well, uh, the title of the slide gives us the answer. Markets are complete if every Arrow de Bruyne security exists. 
All right, so let's think about that situation. Suppose there are capital S Arrow de Brewer securities, one for each state. Then we can stack them together, and the payoff matrix of the securities is the identity matrix. That's a matrix which has ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. All right, and so I've written that as XAD, meaning the payoff matrix that we get by having a complete set of Arrow de Brewer securities. Now, if we have all of these securities, we can actually construct any profile we want by combining the Arrow de Brewer securities. So suppose you wanted to have uh, 10 units in state 1, 3 units in state 2, and 5 units in state capital S. You could buy 10 of these, 3 of these, and 5 of these, and you would be done. So because we can obtain any profile we want in this situation, we say the markets are complete. We don't need anything more in, in order to do everything we might possibly want to do. Well, of course, in practice, if you look out at the market, you won't see securities that look exactly like this. They don't actually exist in practice. Does this mean that the markets are generally incomplete? Well, not so fast. It may be possible to create Arrow de Brewer securities from existing assets. So. Let's suppose we've got a bunch of arbitrary uh, assets with a payoff matrix X. And let's see if we can um, put them together to artificially construct an Arrow de Brewer security. Suppose it's the first one, which has a, a, a state uh, it, which has a payoff 1 in the first state and 0 otherwise. We should ask, is there some portfolio, some vector of weights W here, or, or holdings of the assets, which satisfies the equation w prime x equals 1, 0, 0, 0. Can we solve the equation w prime x equals 1, 0, 0, 0? Well, what is w prime x? It's this combination of um, weights on individual assets times payoffs in each state. And we want to choose these weights such that, we, that when we average them, when we average the XN1s, we get 1. And when we average the, the, the XNSs for any other state, we get 0. But what have we got here, really? We've got uh, a system of S equations with N unknown quantities. All right? The N unknown quantities are these weights, W1 through Wn. And we're solving S equations. Um, because we have to, we have to satisfy uh, that this equals one, the second thing is zero, third thing is zero, and the nth thing is zero. So we have n we have um, uh, s equations for the s states, and we have n unknowns. Now there is a solution if uh, uh, if uh, n equals s, and uh, the assets are non-redundant, which means that no asset payoff is a linear combination of any of the others. All right, so this tells us that markets are complete when there are as many non-redundant assets as there are states. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to um, some basic concepts of finance. Um, uh, discrete state representation of uncertainty, uh, Arrow de Brewer securities and uh, complete markets. We now go on and discuss arbitrage in theory. What is uh, an arbitrage opportunity? An arbitrage opportunity is uh, a wonderful deal if you can get it. Um, good work if you can get it. An arbitrage opportunity is an investment strategy that, first of all, never requires a cash outflow, either now or in the future. You never have to put any money in, uh, uh, pay any money out. And it will give you cash. You will receive cash. You will get a cash inflow uh, in one of two circumstances. Either you're going to get cash in one or more states in the future, but nothing now. That's called a type 1 arbitrage opportunity. Or uh, you, you might get cash now and possibly in one or more states in the future, too. That's a type 2 arbitrage opportunity. Okay, So in the first case, 
you don't have to pay anything now and you won't have to pay anything in the future and there's a chance that you'll make money in the future so it's like being given a free lottery ticket that would be an example in the second case you are actually given money today you're paid to take the lottery ticket so uh, you get money now and you may get money in the future as well now uh, finance theory um, proceeds under the assumption that there are no arbitrage opportunities that these um, deals are so good that if they do arise they're exploited so quickly that they get eliminated and we never observe them you know uh, uh, something that looks too good to be true actually is that's the assumption now uh, one doesn't want to take that too literally uh, there may in fact be riskless profit opportunities that pop up uh, but nonetheless, it's a reasonable benchmark to assume them away. We shouldn't uh, think that financial markets allow this to happen very often or for a very long time. Well, it turns out that this no arbitrage assumption all by itself has powerful implications for the relative prices of assets. What are these implications? The first implication is called the law of one price, or loop, L-O-O-P, loop. And that just says that if you have two assets or portfolios which have the same payoffs in every future state, they must have the same price today. So if they're the same in the future, they've got to be the same today. There can only be one price today. That's why it's the law of one price. Well, why, why must that be true if there are no arbitrage opportunities? If this were not true, what you could do is buy the cheaper of the two assets that are the same in the future, and sell or sell short uh, the uh, the expensive one. Selling short is just borrowing the asset in order to sell it on the market. And in class we uh, are, have discussed the mechanics of that. So if that's possible and two assets or portfolios with the same payoffs in the future have different prices, you buy the cheap one, you sell short the expensive one, and that makes you money today because you the money you get from selling short exceeds the amount you have to pay uh, for, for going long in the cheap asset. You get a cash inflow today, and there will be no costs in any future state. So that's an example of a type 2 arbitrage. It's a, it's, a, it's a money machine. It makes money today. You're going to want to do this on an arbitrary scale, and uh, in so doing, you will eliminate the opportunity. All right, what's a second implication of no arbitrage is that Arrow de Bro securities must have positive state prices. Uh, why is that true? Well, suppose you saw an Arrow de Bro security with a negative price. What would your investment strategy be? You should buy it. You're going to get a cash inflow today. That's what it means to buy something at a negative price. It means you're paid to take it. And you'll also get cash in one future state with no costs in any other state. That's a type 2 arbitrage. Now, even if an Arrow de Bro security has a zero price rather than a negative price, again, you should just buy it. You're going to get a cash inflow in one future state of the world, and there are no costs in any other state. So that is an example of a type 1 arbitrage. Now, um, this concept of no arbitrage generates particularly strong results when markets are complete. Because in that situation, these restrictions allow us to price all possible assets. We already have the state prices QS for each state. If markets are complete, all these Arrow securities exist, we can observe their prices. To price any other asset with any arbitrary payoff vector, we just use the law of one price, which implies that the price PN of an arbitrary asset must be the sum across states of the payoffs on the asset times the uh, state prices. This is sometimes known as the Happy Meal Theorem. Uh, that's an amusing name for it. Just asserting that the price of a Happy Meal must be the sum of the prices of small fries, cheeseburger, drinks, and a toy. Now, uh, in the case of Happy Meals, that's not actually true, and you can't um, uh, necessarily sell short the uh, ingredients of the Happy Meal. Um, uh, or, or, or sell short the, uh, you know, go long the Happy Meal and, and short the ingredients as would be required to eliminate the profit opportunity. But in the case of a financial asset, 
Th this works. The price of a happy meal must be the sum of the prices of the ingredients. Okay, so uh, for our last slide, just to link this back to the three concepts I mentioned at the beginning of this module, we had arbitrage, optimization, and equilibrium. We've talked about arbitrage. Now, what does, no, what does arbitrage do, or the assumption that there is no arbitrage, what does that do? It tells us something about the relative prices of assets, but it says nothing about the absolute prices, in particular the level of each state price, QS. So, in order to study what determines the state prices, we're going to need the other two concepts, optimization, which tells us how individuals demand resources or consumption in each state S, and equilibrium, which is the adjustment of the price QS to ensure that demand is equal to supply. And we'll come back to those concepts later in the course. So I hope you've enjoyed this module, and uh, I welcome you to Economics 1723.